Hi everyone, welcome to this book discussion with Manjima Bhattacharya. She is a feminist researcher, writer and activist. She has been part of the Indian women's movement for over two decades now. She holds a PhD in sociology. Her areas of specialization include gender and sexuality, labor and the body. Her first book, an edited volume, Sarpanch Sahib, was longlisted for the Crossword Best Nonfiction Book of 2009. Her two recent books, uh, Manny Queen, Working Women in India's Glamour Industry, and Intimate City, have been published by Zuban Books. Uh, it is these two books that we will be primarily discussing in today's conversation. On that note, I welcome you, ma'am, to this conversation, and we are very grateful that you took time out to uh, have this uh, brief interview with us. Thank you, thank you so much. Right, uh, to begin with, a question from your recent book, Intimate City. Uh, you write that it is an exploration of commercial flows in Mumbai, which are very sexual in nature. And you look at the changes that have taken place in older, sorry, in older forms of sexual commerce. Uh, in the red light area that you talk about, Kamathipura, as well as the evolution of newer flows, such as those in the online sphere. So I have two interrelated questions for you. Uh, first, uh, what are the forms of sexual commerce in Mumbai today? And how has the internet been able to influence them? And the second is that, uh, what would you describe as the universe of online sexual transactions and uh, who are the parties involved in these transactions? And if you could throw some light on what their experiences have been like. Sure. So I think um, globalization has changed the nature of sexual commerce the world over, you know? And I think um, Elizabeth Bernstein uh, talks about how it's no longer prostitution in the way that you know we knew it or we studied it, but it has become something called post-industrial sexual commerce. And uh, what that actually means is uh, that you know sexual commerce and sex work is now embedded in um, new kinds of um, uh, you know economic uh, um, flows of capital, people. Uh, visions of what is a world city, um, what is entertainment uh, in a world city, and so on. So um, each of these have very these shifts have very local flavors. Uh, I think in Mumbai today, uh, it's a mix of older forms of sexual commerce as well as new forms. And um, I think the world over the red light area has been the most well researched and visible sort of shift uh, that has taken place. They've either shrunk in many places because they occupy a very valuable real estate in the hearts of cities. Um, so either they've become gentrified uh, and become like, you know, these hip uh, shopping centers or residential areas. And uh, in some cases they've been preserved, but in a more regulated way because they form part of the history and culture of a city. So they have a heritage value in that sense. Um, in Bombay, the red light area was that's well known is called Kamathipura. It has uh, radically changed today from what it used to be in the 80s and 90s. Uh, from about 100,000 uh, sex workers in the 80s, um, the census has told us that, you know, we are now have about 1,000 sex workers. There. So that's the, that's the kind of, um, out migration that has happened in that area. And there are many reasons for that. And I detail them in my book, but um, uh, what filmmaker Bishaka Datta calls uh, AIDS, raids and trades. So uh, have sort of destroyed Kamathipura. And uh, by that, it means, um, you know, there is the whole AIDS epidemic that came that sort of made it, uh, um, that reduced footfall to that, to Kamathipura, uh, it became stigmatized in a different way. Sex workers began, began to be known as vectors of disease, um, which had a terrible impact in that area. And, uh, and then you have raids. So you have police raids, you have changing regulation, moral sort of regimes uh, coming up, waves of intolerance where, you know, there are sweeping raids and whole brothels were sort of just sucked clean 
um, by the law and order mechanism. And uh, now you have another shift, which is trades. Because Kamathipur has always been a 24 seven kind of a place, uh, you have small industries and uh, really using those spaces now. So if you go to Kamathipur now, it's completely different from what it used to be. And that's some of the, uh, that's some of the changes that I've tried to document. The demographic is also different. That's another thing that globalization has led to, right? Migration of people. So all over the world, you'll find many sex workers are migrants. And it's the same uh, in places like Kamathipura, where uh, the social demographic is different. The brothel structure has changed. Uh, it's now more nuclear families. It is, I mean, there's a large population of Bengalis, um, which we can tell because the food has changed. So there's always parmal, there's always, always potol bhaja being made in uh, households. Um, and there are other shifts which are continuing to reduce football. So when a... Uh, uh, you know, the Mandi sh has shifted from nearby there to uh, Vashi or New, New Bombay. Um, you know, it, the practice used to be that uh, the laborers would come deliver or pick up, come to pick up, uh, you know, their uh, products from the market and um, stop by in the red light area. But now, now that the market has shifted, there's no such footfall anymore. And of course, the big one is the internet. Uh, now that if you have a mobile phone, there is the internet, why would you need a physical space, which is the red light area? So um, I think it's a combination of these things that have led to a changed um, red light area in Mumbai. It still exists, but in a very different form from the way that many researchers have studied it. And the second bit you ask about the, um, about the internet, so that is the other big area of, uh, you know, again, around the world, the internet has changed how sexual commerce happens. Um, I think one, in the case of Bombay, one is the discursive universe, which is the universe of uh, sexual commerce online. And the other is the real universe of people's experiences. So if I talk of the discursive universe, on online. In my uh, book, I've, I've talked about a content analysis that I did of over 100 websites that, are, that offer escort services, so of escort agencies, or they provide information on where to ac access sexual services. And, you know, sometimes these websites are in the name of the girl, which, which makes you think that this is a website for an independent escort. But then when you enter it, you realize that this is a commonly used ploy by agencies to draw in clients, but they're actually agencies. Um, so this, the discourse here is that uh, what, what they seem to be saying is that escorting or um, transacting, uh, you know, sexual experiences, it's normalized, it's globalized. I mean, some websites even give their rates in dollars. Uh, it's a globally accepted practice. And I think importantly, it constructs both the client and the escort in very gendered uh, and classed sort of uh, ways. You know? So the client is always a global, well-traveled businessman. He works very hard. He deserves to have a glamorous companion when he visits Mumbai. Or uh, maybe he's a tourist who wants to have fun. And the escort agency is this corporate, business, uh, professional, discreet curator uh, who will keep your secrets and who will offer you, um, you know, what, what, what is called the girlfriend experience. And um, so alongside this construction of the client, there's the construction of the escort girl who is uh, obedient. She is there of her own consent. She's not coerced, she's, she wants to be there, she likes to do escorting, and she has beauty and brains. And the names, I think, really were very revealing to me. They're all, uh, you know, like, for example, Natasha Obiroy, Smriti Mishra, Tina Kapoor. You know, it's like, a, uh, they're very clearly upper caste, upper class kind of girl next door names, maybe drawing on Bollywood references. And a lot of the discourse is really like, you know, these girls are very, uh, qualified and well polished, they're like the courtesans of today, and in in many cases they're like matrimonial ads. And 
it's quite uh, and of course clients are always men escorts are always women but um you know when i did interviews with people who provided or offered services through online platforms so if that's the real universe i would say of people's experiences this was not the case you know? and i think firstly it was mostly ordinary people uh, who were offering and seeking you know sexual experiences online clients weren't always men i was surprised to find um, you know service providers male service providers who spoke a lot about female clients and so clearly escorts are also not always women and it's not even so clear cut who is a client or a service provider i mean i found a category of men called cruisers sometimes they are, they offer services sometimes they purchase services sometimes they facilitate um so you know there are all kinds of people it's very, it's much more messy in practice um i think and you know to your question of what are their experiences like um i was one of my respondents i remember said to me you know when i entered uh when i started doing this i never thought that people would be so nice and uh, you know that's i mean it's really uh, insightful for him that uh, he found people who were just ordinary people who wanted who were looking for to be less lonely um, who were looking to fulfill fantasies or explore their sexuality and i think that's that's one thing that i also realized that while um the whole question of sexuality which is so uh, limited in uh, in our society you know um outside marriage there are very few sexual experiences possible and it's often predetermined and marriage is predetermined by caste class etc and so even within a heteronormative heterosexual framework there are in finding intimate experiences um is a, is dangerous in in most people's lives so um yeah i think so you know the what's happening online uh the experiences that i found amongst my interviewees was that people offer and provide services for different reasons it's transactional but not always about payment in cash i mean there may be payment for travel meals gifts friendship a valuable commodity in, in a city like bombay especially for those who come from other towns who don't have a social circle and so it's an antidote to loneliness in the city in a way to connect um anonymously no strings attached and with consent very clearly articulated so um yeah i think i think that should give you a flavor of of uh, some of my findings in the book uh, right it's extremely interesting what you've just talked about and uh, you've also shared some of your experiences uh, you know of doing the study of uh, carrying out your field work but uh, could you tell us a little more in detail about uh, you know how you navigated the city uh, when you're studying such a sensitive matter such as uh, sex work so if you could tell us a little bit more about it yeah um so i think Deepali I think doing research on sexuality broadly and sex work in particular is always difficult so I have been actually working doing research on sex work since 1999 or so so um, you know it has been a really long time it's also changed over time but specifically in you know what you're asking I mean in general sex work research is a gray area it's like a shadow you do shadow research because it's difficult to get access it's uh, difficult because of sort of three what i what i say are the three axes along which sex work is marginalized it is often seen as illegal uh, and it is is often illegal it's informal labor so it's actually hard to do uh, studies in the informal sector generally uh, and uh, it is considered immoral so these three sort of push these uh, you know sex workers to different kinds of margins and it's difficult to access i found that the role of institutions is very important so where you locate yourself as a researcher you know so this particular research i did as part of a project called the urban aspirations project uh which was housed at the tata institute of social science uh, in mumbai it was a post doctoral research and um so you know so either you locate yourself within an academic institution which was very helpful for me 
or you find a trusted interlocutor through NGOs in the UN. I mean, most of my other studies have been through NGOs. So that has been um, very important. I, you know, I think there's, I mean, and sex work research actually offline, so in red light areas, is a very wide field. There's lots of research. You have health researchers, you have legal researchers. The joke is often, you know, if you, that you'll find more researchers in uh, Kamatipura than you'll find sex workers. So, um, but it's very different online, right? Because there's very little research on online sex work. So then there's a difference between when I was navigating the city uh, to do my research, where it was easier, easier access because you know you go with an NGO, you know the you know you know the uh, the pathways to really accessing them. Uh, whereas the it was much more difficult to do sex work to navigate the internet per se uh, on on this because there's no precedent as such. Uh, also, the responses when you're doing research on sex work offline are very rehearsed because often sex workers are very practiced and you know, they've met hundreds of people like you, they know what you want to hear, they know what to say. So it's trickier to do, um, to do research, to, to sort of do interviews with sex workers offline. Online, it's very, it, I found it to be very raw, very, um, you know, it was often the first time that they were doing such kind of reflective interviews. So there was an unrehearsed nature to, to those kind of answers. Um, I think the, the thing about, Doing sex work research is also the question of ethics, and a lot of it is, uh, you know, you learn by doing. Um, you meet in public places. Uh, I think you also learn over time how to behave. Uh, so there is, for example, uh, you know, I learned very early on that you know you you never take offense to being misidentified or identified as one of the sex workers in a red light area. So you, you, I learned from others, you know, how you respond in that situation, because when you're, um, because your, your, if your ideological position is that actually, uh, you know, sex work is a choice that people have made, etc., then you say, okay, I'm not working today. That's a possible answer, or you know, you you develop these answers uh, that uh, that sort of align. Um, align with a values framework. I think it changes with age also. I remember earlier on when I was younger, the strategy was to have to go in twos. Uh, whereas now that I'm older, I feel I, or maybe my own, those were prejudices perhaps or fears. Um, but I think over time, I'm, you know, it's really easier to do this, to do sort of interviews on your own. What I find difficult, honestly, or what I found difficult is uh, when you do interviews or when you're doing research in institutions like the special court, which is one of the places I did research in, uh, which is a special court on um, um, in Mumbai, which deals only with cases of prostitution uh, and trafficking. You know, what do you do when you are researching organizations who you do not ideologically align with? Uh, you don't agree with their ideology or their framework. I think that's that I find difficult to navigate. And the other thing is actually having this, there is often awkwardness, you know, the sexual tension, especially when you're speaking to say male, male clients, etc. But, um, you know, I, I find it difficult to, to not really have those personal conversations, but really how to, you have to have excellent tools. That's part of the, uh, that's part of the seek, sort of the way of getting around some of these issues. You have to make yourself vulnerable too. I, I feel like I can't expect someone to really share uh, very intimate parts of their life without uh, spilling some of your secrets too and making yourself vulnerable too. So those kind of, mental pathways are difficult to navigate but on the whole you know offline it's been a tried and tested path and you're really following uh precedents of online it's much more difficult I find. although the it's very rewarding right so even your other book uh the uh, mani queen uh book which emerged out of your doctoral research 
is uh, dealing with the glamour world, which is again very difficult to do field work in. We know how artists and performers are, their timetables and schedules are not like are very flexible and they get called in an emergency situation. So uh, can you share something about doing field work in such a situation about your access and so that it inspires young uh, you know, people also working on similar areas to sort of keep this interview and then your book in mind? Yeah, so I mean, I did my PhD a really long time ago. Uh, it was 2004, 2005, where I did, when I did my actual field work. So that's a really long time back. You know, in, uh, in sociology and anthropology, usually you have to sort of roll up your sleeves and, you know, get, get um, dressed down when you go into the field as such, right? We all have a field work wardrobe uh, in, in a way. But uh, in my case, it was like, you know, one had to dress up. And um, in that time, of course, dressing up, I mean, we thought that wearing a, white shirt and jeans was very classy and that was like the limit of our dressing up but uh, I think for me you know Ritupana, what the difficulty was is that there was no field I could not go away somewhere and uh, be there and you know so the field was this industry that was really disparate it didn't come together and then I thought about it and I realized that okay uh, when everything comes together is during fashion week. Um, so I realized that, all right, my entry into the field has to be Black May India Fashion Week, which is what it was called then. And, um, you know, but the problem was that it's only, it's only there for a week. So it only every, all the actors and, you know, it comes together only for one week. It's gone a week later. It reconstitutes a year later, but then it's a different field in a sense, you know? So, um, so anyway, that was my sort of starting point. Uh, um, it was of course not easy because, you know, I, one doesn't, I didn't know anybody who, uh, who could help me get access. So you try different things, I think. You, know, you try institutional access. I tried to get access to the Fashion Design Council of India. Later on, I, um, I got access to lots of interviews through the Elite Agency, which was uh, a modeling agency. Um, but this, all, all this was able to happen once I'd identified all the actors in the landscape, you know, who could help me have access. Um, but I think students know, I don't know if it's very different now at that time, fieldwork was like the wild, wild west, right? It's very unpredictable. It's not something that was taught uh, in my time. You learned by doing, you learned, I mean, you had to trust your instincts. Um, you knew that, okay, I have to find the right people, you know, the village witch doctor uh, who can tell you a lot of stories and really um, be the one who can uh, interpret a lot of things for you. you. You know that you have to take opportunities when they come. I got lucky in that fashion week at that time used to be held in a hotel, which is a public place. So at least you can enter a hotel and you can be in the lobby and you can you know just try and approach people just like that. And uh, I think I was in the first 2004, I spent just identifying actors and trying to, and really meeting rejection at every turn. 2005, uh, when I went back to Fashion Week, I think within the first day, I, um, I, I, I did not find success. Uh, and then suddenly one, suddenly I think the end of the day, I found two uh, models in the toilet, outside a toilet. And I approached them and I was very desperate. And I said, listen, I really need to go backstage. I need your help. And one of them said, oh, okay, you're doing a PhD. My sisters are doctor, are PhDs. And so, okay, come and meet me tomorrow between hairstyling and makeup, which I had no idea what that meant at that time. But, you know, so actually finding her and, then getting access to her. Once I was in backstage, then I was there for that whole week, you know, which was a breakthrough. So you have breakthrough moments and then you capitalize on that and uh, you try and, I mean, there are informal ways you try and build connections. There's always the smoker's corner or there is, you know, there's at that time, you know, there were those kinds of informal ways you uh, connected with people. Then, the, then there's always snowball, uh, you know, people who then, listen to your who've 
who you've interviewed, they realize that, okay, this is not threatening. This is not, uh, you know, this seems harmless in a sense, especially, you know, like for models, they're concerned. I mean, many of them would be surprised that you're not going to take pictures of me. You just want to hear me talk. Um, you know, so they would come dressed up and they would be like, but why, why are you not taking pictures of me? Um, but, you know, when they realize that, okay, this is harmless, then they'll suggest a friend to you or something like that. So it happens in those kinds of ways. And I think persevering is really, really one of those things, you know, that I think a PhD teaches you and it's there for life. You keep following up. You follow up, follow up, follow up, and you become a pest. Um, but, you know, you, it's one of those things that, you know, you really have to do. You also learn that, you know, there are ways, every industrial setup has ways of uh, how people are looking at each other. You know, you know, you're also being observed. So, I mean, I found that even when I had interviewed someone, I met them again the next time. I didn't know them very well, but there was a, practice of air kissing that used to happen at that time and if a third person saw that okay this model is air kissing you then they become more open to you speaking to them so just you know those kinds of um, serendipitous things as well as strategic things you bring together to create to, to sort of maximize what you can uh, you know when you're doing field work and um, I think the things I found important were that, of course, don't give up. I've already said that. And there was no social media at that time. So there was, uh, you know, you couldn't Google people and look them up before you met them, which I suppose people would do now if you were to go for an interview, which I think was, uh, was interesting. Um, but, you know, you meet people in their spaces, their chosen spaces. Uh, that I found very important to really... Uh, having richer interviews and being able to contextualize their lives and their stories in that, uh, you know, in the lives that they were leading them at that moment. Um, yeah, and I always find very flexible conversations have good tools, but also very flexible conversations so that and always create space for other people to ask you questions. That's also I, I found very, very important in both my studies, or in all my studies so far. Right, uh, you know, so my question to you again now comes, it, it's important because, uh, you know, uh, it also uh, shows how you probably, you know, approached uh, your subject and how you carried out your research so uh, because you're both an activist and academic right so how did you balance uh, both sides of your uh, life when you were carrying out uh, research for both of these books so yeah so I've been part of the Indian women's movement for over 20 years now and, and even when I was uh, in college I was part of a women's group uh, and I've continued to work in the development sector as a researcher and gender specialist. So I, I'm not a sociologist within acad academia. Um, and that's my occupation is within the development sector, even though it rests on my training as a sociologist. There are times uh, in my life where I take a break and I, I take time out to do more pure academic work uh, as a indulgence perhaps or uh, you know, just because something's really been bothering me, I've been thinking about something and I need to take time out and do, do research on it. But honestly, in everyday life, both complement one another completely. You know? So um, I think three things. One is that they offer me, a, I mean, my academic side really always gives me a conceptual framework to do my activist work in. My activist side is always um, pushing me to ask myself, what will this research contribute to? What is this research for the sake of? You know, uh, why are you doing this? Um, and the, the lens that I actually get through academia, whether it is the feminist lens or my lens as a sociologist, that is what actually um, gives me like a third eye or, you know, like a filter through which to like, um, to really 
understand, to make sense of uh, whether it is what's happening in life in general, of course, but within um, within my my professional life too. So whether it is within my activist work or in my research. So I think they both complement each other. I think they only it becomes an issue, like I said, when there is an ideological conflict. So for example, in Mannequin, which was a, a study of, it was an ethnography of women working in the modeling industry. Um, you know, when I started that study, I was working in a feminist group and, you know, we had made uh, these, I mean, I was part of protests against say beauty pageants and so on. And really, uh, not understanding why women would choose to what was then called objectification and commodification of their bodies. And through the study, I moved to another position, but it was a very strong ideological position, you know, and it influenced, and these ideological positions, obviously they influence your conceptual framework, they influence your research question, and they influence the interaction that you have with your, uh, with the people you're researching. Um, that was the case with mannequin. With intimate city, of course, the issue has been um, that the minute you talk about sex work, people ask you, what is your position on prostitution? Do you, don't you think it is violence against women? Uh, don't you think these women are being coerced into doing sex work? Um, and this is, there have been two very strong positions, polarized positions within feminism globally, as well as in India where one group thinks that, uh, believes that, you know, there is no such thing as sex work. It is a form of violence against women and women cannot consent to um, sex, trading in uh, sexual services. The other side believes that uh, it is a form of labor, it is sex, it's a service provision and it is sex work per se. And women can consent to, uh, to sort of trading in sex. So, you know, these are the two positions that you are immediately hit with as soon as you start doing sex work research. And it takes time to evolve your own position uh, where you stand based on what you hear and so on and what you think. So these, these positions uh, actually are lead to a problem because when you're an activist, you have a strong position. When you're an academic, you're expected to not have a position. So that's where it, the problem comes up. In both these cases, how did I resolve this um, conflict? I found that in Mannequin, ethnography as a methodology helped me uh, really see my respondents as people and really create created a space for uh, reflexive engagement. You know, then uh, and then in the second case, in Intimate City, I found that the entry point I chose, which is sex work geographies to really look at space and how space is used um, in sexual commerce and what who is in that space, how is how what are the relations between uh, people within a certain space. That entry point changed the focus on the ideology. So that's, uh, so you know, there are these conflicts, but then you find a way out. And you know, honestly, I more and more, I believe that uh, sociology in itself is, a form of activism um, and is different from when it started out as an objective social science. Uh, it was more passive perhaps, but it, I think it has really moved since then. And you know, when we talk about the sociological imagination, it is what a society could look like or could be. And so I think that, that uh, yeah, that, that helps me sort of reconcile a lot of these different roles that I play. I also feel that more and more sociologists are bringing themselves into the picture, you know? And uh, that's another dilemma when you're an activist. Do you really bring that role when you're writing up, when you're writing your book or writing your research report and so on? What, uh, and of course, as part of transparency and ethics, you should, but often you're not supposed to. And it's not easy to do, but it does open up conversation in different ways. Like the difference between, I would say, my PhD and my book in the case of Mannequin. In the PhD, I am absent from, from my uh, thesis, you know, whereas the book, which 
was a completely rewritten new, um, new text, I decided that I must put myself in, the, in there. And when I put myself in there, I realized that, oh, okay, this book is not actually just about uh, women working in the glamour industry. This book is also about me and my ideological shifts. And this book is about fashion and feminism. And you know how both of them have evolved over time. So um, yeah, I find you know even just putting ourselves into books as academic, as activists um, or as just who we are, bringing that into academic work is important for decolonization or intersectionality or really being able to understand each other's standpoints. Um, it's key to all these things. I hope I've answered your question. I feel like I went a little bit off the... No, no, not at all. Uh, so our last question is kind of related. Uh, we've seen and you've talked about the shifts within sociology itself. Do you think that uh, the very fact that we have become more interdisciplinary now and there is more engagement with other disciplines as well as you know the outside world, it has made an impact in how research is done as well as on the act of writing, you know, how both of these dynamics have changed. Yeah, I, uh, you know, I, when I went to, when I did my PhD, doing interdisciplinary work was considered quite, uh, there were very few people who were doing interdisciplinary work. There were not, I mean, at that time, even the women's studies um, unit had just started. It's now a center, I believe. But at that time, uh, you know, it had just it started as a center, uh, as a unit or something like that. And um, now, I mean, there are so many different departments and centers and, you know, which is wonderful. I mean, um, I've... And I really envy, you know, students today who get a chance to actually uh, experiment with different things, with different disciplines. And really, there is this the cultural studies approach and um, various approaches. I think it's wonderful. I found, I found a lot of that in feminism, you know. And so feminist studies for me was my uh, door to interdisciplinary work. And I think uh, it must be so for many, many uh, academics in my generation. Um, I think the met you know the methodologies are also very interdisciplinary, and that is where I find uh, I find it very interesting. So, for example, ethnography uh, has often been seen as the domain of anthropologists, and writing even has been seen as something that anthropologists do. You know, they have the thick description and it's the juicy real life stuff that they get, whereas uh, sociology is saddled with like dry theory and uh, not really uh, looked, at, looked at as a very rich in writing uh, traditions. Um, but something like ethnography straddles sociology, straddles anthropology, straddles a range of uh, disciplines. Uh, and even like, you know, there's market uh, oriented ethnography as well. So it's, uh, uh, I think, and now methods are also changing. So in ethnography, I've been reading about different new kinds of ethnography, something called flash ethnography, which is sort of flash fiction writing, writing with small bursts of fiction that really grasp the, um, the political economy, the feel, uh, and give you an ethnographic sense of the lived reality of a community, of a space, of people, and so on. Or there is something, uh, you know, patchwork ethnography, which is a much more real understanding of what, uh, what it means to do ethnography. It's not going away somewhere and being there for two years. It is really integrated into life, everyday life, you know. Um, it is about having children, raising kids, uh, being a carer, um, maybe, you know, having a disability or having so many constraints um, in life and still doing research, still doing rigorous research. So uh, that, you know, it brings in a new, new element of uh, interdisciplinarity in that sense, right? So I find methods as very important um, a way of uh, really practicing interdisciplinarity in, in the field. 
when it comes to writing, writing is another way that, you know, uh, and different forms of writing, writing really, you have to be born. I mean, you have to be historical, you have to uh, bring in stories. I mean, there's so many ways of, um, of being a different kind of researcher through writing. Unfortunately, we are not, I mean, at least we in, in college were not taught how to write uh, per se. You know, writing was not considered a very important kind of a skill in, the, in that uh, time. Now, today it is perhaps. But for me, writing is when, where your critical theory and your experiences can meet. Uh, and it's also a way of clarifying. For me, rewriting is a way of thinking through an argument. So I cannot imagine doing sociology without writing and rewriting and rewriting. Uh, it's a way for me of, of really thinking about an argument, um, finding out what is at the core and really, uh, really, really arriving at a theory perhaps, you know? So I, um, yeah, I think for me, that is, that's the big um, function of, uh, of writing um, in sociology. Right. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Bhattacharya, for uh, taking time out uh, on a Saturday afternoon to talk to us. And, uh, you know, you've talked about both of your books, which are extremely interesting. And uh, to our viewers, please go and grab copies of the book and uh, read them because, uh, you know, uh, they talk about something which is extremely like it's an area of research, which is extremely important and at the same time, uh, extremely interesting as well. So uh, thank you once again, Dr. Bhattacharya, for taking time out, ma'am, and talking to us today. Thank you so much to both you, Pipali and Rituparna. Thank you. I enjoyed it greatly.